This is The Red Line, where we interview three big geopolitical experts on one big subject shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. I feel like this week's focus has been the background of so many of our episodes, always an example or a symptom of a problem we're attempting to cover, always in the background, but never the main focus. In our piece on Transnistria, we talked about the Russian-backed breakaway republics that Georgia was also contending with. In our Caspian piece, we talked about the importance of Georgia's mediation, as well as the fact that the neutral pipeline housing is key to the regional energy development. In our Ukraine piece, we talked about the signals that were sent to Georgia in 08, were a warning for things to come later on in Crimea. Georgia has always been on our periphery, but never our main focus, which is kind of not a terrible analogy for the current geopolitical position in the country, being smashed between Iran, Turkish, and Russian-influenced areas. But whilst the immense Caucasus mountains that surround Georgia help keep enemies out, they also help trap enemies in. So this week we take a look at Georgia, its breakaway republics of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, its balancing act between Moscow, Washington, Ankara and Tehran, and what is next for this crossroads nation. And to talk more about that, we turn to our first guest. Part 1. Stomping Ground Well, well Georgia is a relatively small post-Soviet state in the South Caucasus uh, with a population of approximately 3.8 million people. It's an overwhelmingly Orthodox Christian and ethnically Georgian population, but it, it is two unresolved territorial disputes from its time as the Soviet Republic with Abkhazia in the northwest of the country and with South Ossetia, which is northwest of Tbilisi, the capital. Uh, the country is heavily mountainous. It, it has some beautiful landscapes uh, and scenery. And it, it's located in a region that historically is a crossroads of empires. So you have the Persian Empire, or you had the Persian Empire to the south, the Ottoman Empire to the west, and the Russian Empire, the most consequential actually in recent Georgian history to the north. Now, over the last two decades, the country has been an object of contestation between the West and Russia. It, it is and remains much more strategic to Russia than to the United States or Europe. And um, we have to remember that Georgia borders on the most volatile region in Russia, the, the North Caucasus, which, which, as you know, is the site of multiple separatist insurgencies against the Russian state. Uh, uh, those insurgencies flaring, particularly in the 1990s and the early uh, 2000s. And it, it's worth remembering that, you know, Vladimir Putin vaulted to the presidency in Russia because of his tough response against perceived Chechen terrorism in Moscow and elsewhere. And it, it was really the North Caucasus that defined him as a new Russian leader. And he supervised and prosecuted the Second Chechen War, often quite brutally, as you probably know, which eventually resulted in the pacification of the Chechen Republic within the Russian Federation. But what's important here to remember is parts of Georgia were used as a sanctuary by Chechen fighters. And the Russian state has always been concerned about how the country could be used by its enemies against it. Uh, the Pankisi Gorge is the area in, in particular that was highly contentious uh, in the early 2000s. Though, thus, it looked very negatively, Russia looked very negatively on the effort by Georgia, initially actually under the form former Soviet foreign minister, Edward Chavanadze, to join NATO. And having an enemy alliance on its southern doorstep was something it, it could not accept. Gerard Toll is a professor of government and international relations at Virginia Polytechnic, as well as the author of Near Abroad, Putin, the West, and the contest of Ukraine and the Caucasus. Gerard is one of the leading experts on the history of the Caucasus, and he joins us today. Um, the U.S.'s ties to, to Georgia were initially personalistic, uh, but subsequently strategic and ideological. 
first it was James Baker trying to help his own fr his old friend Edward Chevernadze, uh, the former Soviet uh, minister, as I, I mentioned. Uh, both of them worked very well together to help um, um, dampen uh, and end the Cold War in uh, in Europe. No insignificant achievement, a massive achievement. Um, but Georgia's strategic significance changed uh, after September 11th, uh, uh, 2001, when the US um, went in and overthrew the Taliban in Afghanistan and began to establish bases in Central Asia to support its war there. So Georgia became a transit point on the uh, to support the, uh, the US war in Afghanistan. Um, then the, the Bush administration, you could say, fell in love with an eager young uh, a crusader from the West uh, in Georgia, uh, um, the politician that is well known, Mikhail Saakashvili, who had successfully ousted Shevardnadze in his so-called Rose Revolution in November 2003. And, and Georgia effectively became a cause for those interested in extending the free world to the Caucasus and prom promoting freedom and democracy, you know, the kind of buzzwords that were uh, used by neoconservatives in the US state at that time. And the Bush administration strongly backed Georgia as a candidate for NATO membership, which of course was anathema to Russia. And that the consequence is that the country became a front in a larger geopolitical struggle. And I think with, with negative consequences all around. What makes Georgia stand out as a post-Soviet republic? What makes them different to the other ones like Ukraine or Belarus? So I think there are three things that uh, you need to keep in mind uh, as to why Georgia is distinctive as a post-Soviet uh, republic. First of all, you have the territory legacies of Soviet rule. Um, Georgia um, does not become an independent state in a clean way without its territorial integrity uh, challenged. Uh, there are two autonomous republics, Abkhazia and Ajaria, and then there's an autonomous region, South Ossetia, that are a result of Soviet rule. And in fact, the sort of the, the territorial body of Georgia is a consequence of Bolshevik rule. Um, but it was left with these legacies uh, because these were homelands of titular peoples, or at least in, in, the, in the case of Abkhazia and in South Ossetia. Um, and Abkhazia actually was a former Union Republic. Um, and so the memory of that status fired ethnic Abkhaz nationalists who saw Abkhazia as their homeland. And they were very threatened by the prospect of an independent Georgia because that was something that they felt would uh, essentially abolish their autonomy and their, um, their self-determination. Georgia has this dream of being elsewhere. <clears throat> it, it's, uh, there's an ideology in Georgia that sees itself as an ancient European country. And it sort of doesn't see itself as part of the South Caucasus in certain ways. So it's not reconciled to its location. And, and you know, in one sense, this is positive. It is aspiring for Euro-Atlantic uh, values and, and the like and uh, standards. And so that is uh, ostensibly positive. But, you know, it doesn't, uh, in one sense, um, grasp that its particular location is in the Caucasus and in the South Caucasus uh, on the um, southern doorstep of Russia. And there are certain necessities that come from that. Um, and uh, so not acknowledging those strategic necessities, I think, has cost Georgia and its, um, its fate in the post-Soviet period. At the breakup of the Soviet Union, Georgia is one of the countries that got off relatively lightly in terms of civil unrest. Whilst Armenia, Ukraine, and Tajikistan, and many others broke out into fighting, Georgia had a lot of the same leadership continue through from the Soviet era. That was until one of Georgia's most polarizing figures, Mikhail Saakashvili, came to power. Can you take us through the impact that Saakashvili had on Georgia? Mikhail Saakashvili... Um is a, a very interesting figure, a um, tragic figure in some ways, still very active uh, in uh, his involvement in Georgian politics. Um, I think he's, he has a claim to being one of the most impactful figures in um, post-independence Georgia. Um, he was, uh, you know, is blessed with um, lots of uh, natural talents, um, 
intelligence and uh, charisma. Um, but he's also a, a deeply flawed figure too, uh, who essentially um, created a, a very damaging populist, right-wing populism within Georgia that has set back the country's efforts to try to um, develop a more integrated country uh, and pursue um, a degree of reconciliation with Abkhazia and with South Ossetia. I mean, the, the history of Georgia is one of um, revolutionary nationalists coming to power with grand uh, visions of um, transforming the country. Mikhail Saakashvili was uh, um, a young, uh, ambitious um, reformer who um, acquired a Western education and then was picked uh, by Shevardnadze uh, to, uh, to try to um, reform Georgia. Um, and through a, another kind of key figure, uh, came back to, to Georgia, became a minister of justice, became a, 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 a sort of a, a crusader for uh, institutional reform, then broke with Shevardnadze and um, eventually led an intra-elite um, revolt against his rule. And as a consequence of, um, of that, was able to take power, uh, the so-called Rose Revolution, uh, in, at the end of uh, 2003. Um, and he um, inherited a state that was um, essentially bankrupt. Uh, it was hollowed out. Uh, it had suffered years of uh, mismanagement and corruption. And he... Um, galvanized young reformers, gathered them around him, and they really began to, uh, to implement a sort of a radical revisioning of the state, rejecting the Soviet legacy, rejecting bureaucracy. Uh, and they took it in a, um, in a sort of libertarian direction. Uh, and um, so he initially had considerable uh, success. Uh, now he's starting from a very low level, um, but he also had uh, support for Western partners. But the tragedy of Saakashvili is that his personality was one that uh, was very domineering, um, and um, you ended up with a situation where a lot of the talented Georgians that he had gathered around him uh, broke with him uh, because of his uh, authoritarianism and because of his, um, uh, I guess, his populism. And, and there's, there's a, a phrase in Georgia, government by day and government by night. And uh, Saakashvili uh, would work into the night uh, but there was a lot of um, sort of dealing and scheming uh, going on. He had this grand vision of transforming the country. He wanted to go at a breakneck speed. He didn't want, he didn't broke a compromise. Uh, he, he, he knew he was charismatic and uh, he sought to push the envelope. Uh, boldness had always served uh, Saakashvili uh, very well, um, but it led to, I think, certain fatal uh, mistakes that he made. Saakashvili did a lot of work to try and clean up some of the street-level corruption, which was good. But successes in the early days made him bolder and bolder, and this boldness ended up being the country's major downfall, when in 2008 he declared war on the Russian-backed region of South Ossetia a breakaway Soviet Republic that would closely align with Moscow in the north of Georgia. He tried to do what no other ex-Soviet had ever done, retake their breakaway Republic by military force. But how did this end up going? Can you take us through the story? 
Well, you can look at the August War as a, a geopolitical drama of five acts. It, it was, in, in essence, a, a local village and, and town war in the South Caucasus that became, for a short time in August 2008, a global geopolitical crisis, and, and actually something that could potentially have changed the tight presidential race at that time between John McCain and Barack Obama uh, in the U.S., and in fact, just a little aside, there, there's lots of evidence that Obama picked Joe Biden as his vice presidential candidate because of the August War uh, and the felt need to neutralize McCain's perceived uh, foreign policy expertise uh, on Georgia and elsewhere. And, you know, that was a consequential moment. And that guy Biden, uh, I, uh, he ended up somewhere, I don't know. In any case, um, so the first act is really... Um, in early 2008, when Kosovars unilaterally declared independence. And this was widely recognized by uh, Western powers in, in Europe uh, and the United States. And, and Vladimir Putin, who was Mr. Territorial Integrity of States at this time, you know, the person who was a uh, who had fought the uh, Chechen war to preserve the territorial integrity of the Russian Federation, he roundly condemned this. Uh, and he suggested that there would be consequences of this in the Caucasus. Um, Act two is the NATO summit when you have um, a, the a, a effort by uh, Georgia and Ukraine to get a membership action plan for um for the countries and to join NATO um there's a dispute between the US and the Baltic states that are pushing strongly to admit both Ukraine and Georgia into um into NATO um I by giving them a membership action plan. And then there's uh, France and Germany who are pushing back against this. They don't see this as a good idea. Uh, these are not countries that have um, settled territorial borders, uh, the settled territorial disputes. And they're also buying a whole lot of trouble uh, because they're right up against uh, Russia. And Russia has made it very clear that it's against uh, these countries joining. So the the compromise was this statement that they will uh, one day join NATO. And it was a compromise that uh, was actually um, one that sort of charted their manifest destiny as being part of NATO, and I think radicalized the situation. Um, so the third act is the things get really quite tense in the Caucasus. There's a um, considerable concern that there's going to be a war uh, between uh, Georgia and uh, Abkhazia. Um, um, Mikhail Saakashvili has built up the military in Georgia um, and has um, considerable U.S. support because he's providing troops Georgian troops to fight alongside the U.S. in Iraq. Uh, and so he feels that there's a certain debt that the U.S. owes to Georgia because of this um, in friendship uh, participation in the coalition of the willing. Um, um, Condoleezza Rice goes to try to smooth things over, to uh, calm uh, what are becoming increasingly hot heads within uh, the Caucasus, both in Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and in Georgia. Um, but she makes a statement, a public statement, um, uh, there in uh, Tbilisi, uh, where she says, we take very strongly our obligation to defend our allies. And, you know, that's, that ostensibly was in response to a question about Israel, uh, uh, Israel, Palestine, uh, and Middle East. Um, but Saakashvili really heard what he wanted to hear which was the U.S. is going to uh, provide uh, support uh, if the Georgia um, takes uh, action against what it sees as increasingly intolerable levels of, of violence. Um, there's a lot of uh, shelling of um, South Ossetian um, in South Ossetia of uh, Georgian villages within South Ossetia, and there's um, there's uh, tit-for-tat killings in that area. Uh, the fourth act is really a crucial act, and that is where, after uh, all of this, um, Saakashvili decides to escalate. 
Uh, and he escalates by um, implementing a plan that he had been cooking up for quite a while with uh, former um, U.S. military advisors and others. And, you know, there's details still to come out on this. Um, and that plan was to seize uh, South Ossetia and to sweep aside uh, the Russian-supported local uh, de facto state there. And so he uh, began shelling um, uh, the city with Grad missiles, and it was essentially shelling uh, uh, a population, a, a, a city which had uh, some of its population evacuated, but there were still civilians in the city, and uh, this was uh, essentially shelling of civilian uh, areas as well as uh, as the particular uh, military base there, which had some uh, Russian peacekeepers. Well, um, that was, I think, a disastrous move on his part. It was a reckless move. Uh, um, and uh, Russia responded. Russia was uh, prepared for some particular actions uh, in general, but uh, I think they were taken by surprise at the particular move in South Ossetia and when it occurred. Um, uh, Putin uh, was in Beijing uh, at the time, and um, but nevertheless, they had standing orders and the Russian troops were quickly in the Rocky Tunnel uh, to go to uh, into South Ossetia. But in, interestingly, they actually stopped um, before the Georgian villages in South Ossetia to await further, uh, further instructions from uh, Putin and Medvedev, who was the uh, nominal president of Russia at that particular time. Um, eventually, uh, the, the upshot of it all is, is that uh, they got uh, instructions to push back the um, the Georgians, they pounded Georgia uh, itself, uh, as well as uh, moved against the Georgian troops that had taken certain positions within uh, South Ossetia, uh, and the thing very quickly became a rout. It was a very traumatizing event for uh, Georgians. I think we have to have a lot of sympathy for, for them. Um, uh, but, um, you know, it quickly became framed by uh, Saakashvili as Russia invades Georgia, when in actuality it was uh, Saakashvili's government invaded South Ossetia, and then that triggered a Russian invasion. Um, so there was more complexity to it than is, um, is given in the, just the frame of um, Russia invades Georgia. Um, and I think that, uh, th you know, that was Act 5, and perhaps the concluding scene is where Mr. Territorial Integrity, Vladimir Putin, becomes Mr. Self-Determination of Oppressed Peoples uh, in, the, uh, in August of 2008, when Russia makes the crucial kind of decision, another uh, crucial turning point, which is that it recognizes the independence of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. It says that, you know, like Kosovo, these are now independent states, and we're going to recognize them as such. And of course, that particular act um, was largely a unipolar, unilateral uh, recognition. It got uh, support from a few other states, but very few states, uh, pro-Russian states in the world or Pacific Island states that uh, you could pay money to have them recognize your uh, independent or your de facto state as an independent state. Um, but I think it's a, a very interesting story of how someone who is very committed to and comes to power as a, um, a territorial integrity champion uh, ends up becoming a champion of a, um, a policy which is dismantling the territorial integrity of Georgia and then subsequently uh, of Ukraine. Um, and so Kosovo is really quite key in that whole story, and, and telling that story is one that I think has to has to go through the Balkans. And with Russia now in major control of South Ossetia and Abkhazia, what is life like on the ground there? What has changed for the people in these two regions? So, um, you know, the situation was not perfect um, uh, <clears throat> after the wars of the early 1990s, but there was still, um, there was still movement. Uh, you could still, uh, Georgians could still go to Skin Valley and uh, Ossetians could go to Tbilisi. And so there was some trade. Uh, and in fact, there was a considerable contraband trade 
um, going on uh, in South Ossetia in a place called Ergoneti. Um, and uh, this was one of the first things that the um, Saakashvili government cracked down on was the contraband trade that happened there. And, you know, for good reasons, in as much as this was lost tax revenue for the Georgian state. But the consequence of that is that they effectively cut off uh, um, a set of uh, interconnections between Ossetians and Georgians, a uh, trade, uh, which uh, bound them together, which gave them a common interest, uh, and then which kept flows going. There were um, lots of uh, 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 Georgians still living within South Ossetia, and certainly the relations were not perfect with the uh, Ossetians that uh, had mostly congregated in Skin Valley. There were still some, a few Georgians uh, in Skin Valley because, you know, the populations were uh, intermarried, uh, and um, so there were, uh, it wasn't completely ethnically homogenous. Um, and, but all of that was lost, and effectively, as a consequence of the war, you had um, the creation of ethnically homogenous, close to ethnically homogenous populations. There's a, a place called uh, Akalgori or Leningori, which is a sort of its own separate story. Uh, and there are still Georgians to this day, mostly elderly Georgians, living in that area. That area is controlled by the Republic of South Ossetia. Um, I, but yeah, uh, one of the consequences of the war is that the Russian presence um, was, you know, now legitimated as a necessary presence in order to defend South Ossetia from uh, invading Georgian uh, state. And um, so they started to build um, border fences uh, and began to demarcate a um, uh, border. Now, the very term border is, of course, deeply contested. Uh, Georgians um, called an occupation line. Um, the EU and, and others uh, call it an administrative boundary line. Um, and uh, the South Ossetians call it a border. Um, and that, is, that has been hardening uh, for quite a while. Uh, and as a consequence, the, the traffic between South Ossetia and Georgia uh, is very limited. It's often shut down completely. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a tragic situation, but it's, it is a function of um, war and what war has done. Polarized people, uh, alienated people. And as a consequence today, young people in South Ossetia, uh, whereas their fathers and mothers and certainly their grandfathers would have been very familiar familiar with uh, Georgia and would have spoken Georgian in many instances. Uh, young people today, they, and, you know, when I met them when I went there uh, to, to South Ossetia, they are all orientated towards uh, North Ossetia. And they go regularly, often every weekend, uh, to Vladikavkaz uh, through the Rocky Tunnel. Um, and so there's, and there's no connection. They haven't been to Tbilisi. Um, so you have this sort of massive disconnect. You have, a, in effect, an enclave within a, what is internationally recognized as part of Georgia, a, an enclave which is completely orientated towards uh, Russia. And in fact, because myself and my research colleagues, we have done uh, considerable research in South Ossetia on, on public attitudes, uh, the, there's strong support for joining Russia. They, they would join Russia in a heartbeat. In 1861, the United States entered a civil war, with a number of states pulling away and forming the Confederacy. But at least with that war, it drew to a close, something the Georgians currently don't have. The United States also didn't have to contend with a huge regional power that bordered the Confederacy and positioned enough troops in there to take over the rest of the United States. Again, Georgia isn't that fortunate with Russia positioned bordering both of these breakaway republics and with enough troops to not only conquer Georgia, but annihilate it completely. To try and put this in an American perspective, Georgia's situation right now would be like Washington State and Pennsylvania pulling away from the United States and forming Russian-backed republics. And remember, the US almost went to nuclear war in 1961 over Russian troops in Cuba, all the way over the ocean. 
the Georgian situation is very dire. And this is what Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia, lives with every single day. Russian troops deployed on the Tbilisi side of the mountains. These same mountains the Georgians have relied on for a millennia to protect them from outside forces. And now the biggest natural obstacle protecting them means nothing, as the Russians are already deployed on both sides of the mountains. But what impact do these two breakaway republics have on Georgia? And what is Russia's plan for them? Well, for that, we turn to our second guest. Part 2. Moving the Fence Posts Georgia is located at the heart of a very challenging region of the South Caucasus with two occupied regions on its soil, namely Abkhazia and Srinvani regions of so-called so South Setia. And uh, Georgia is confronted with a myriad of uh, security challenges. Georgia is a pioneer of Russian aggression, which has its complex historic roots. Yet the conflict is still ongoing. From initially using conventional means, Russia has increasingly switched to employing hybrid tools of warfare, including financial and economic tools, spreading disinformation and executing cyber attacks, uh, all of which enables the Kremlin to seek its goals in a more cost-efficient and timely manner. Thus, threats and challenges stemming from the Russian Federation is the main challenge currently facing uh, the country. Nadia Saskoria is an associate fellow for the Royal United Services Institute for Defense and Security Studies, an on-resident fellow at the Middle East Institute, a young advisor for Chatham House, a lecturer of Russian politics at University College London, and made Forbes 30 under 30 list. But most importantly though, she's an expert on Georgia and its relationship with Russia and its satellites. We are very pleased to have her join us today. Even at the time of the global pandemic, the Kremlin continues to process uh, the process of growing militarization of occupied territories on Georgian soil and ethnic discrimination of Georgian population. Russia is furthermore actively implementing the policy of so-called borderization along the occupation line, leading to the further deterioration of humanitarian situation on the ground. Russian occupation of 20% of Georgian territories and illegal annexation of Crimea has considerably shifted the Black Sea security land landscape and turned the Black Sea into the battleground of conflicting interests, while Moscow's provoca provocative moves in the region indicate at its determination to further uh, challenge the pro-Western aspirations in the region, Georgia considers itsel itself to be an inherent part of Black Sea security framework and is committed to contribute to the Black Sea security. We've talked about this quite a number of times on the show. Russia's love for fermenting breakaway republics in the surrounding states. Breakaway states that form a de facto independent nation and answers more closely to Moscow than their own nation's capital. Moldova has Transnistria, Ukraine has Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics, Armenia and Azerbaijan have the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic. But Georgia has two of them, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Abkhazia being located in the northwest corner of Georgia along the bank of the Black Sea, and South Ossetia being located just north of Tbilisi, that forms a disconnected state bordering Russia's Ossetia region in the North Caucasus. Both Abkhazia and South Ossetia are very different from one another, so I want to understand a little bit more about both of these two first. How is Abkhazia different from Georgia or South Ossetia? So Abkhazia is a region located at the Black Sea coast in the northwest part of Georgia, sharing a border with Russia. Um, Abkhazia had autonomous status inside uh, Soviet Georgia and kept close ties to Russia. In 1990s, at the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union, both uh, um, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, the so-called South Ossetia, Tsrin Valley region, fought conflicts with Tbilisi. And following the August War of 2008, uh, these two regions were recognized as independent states by Moscow. Um, as of today, uh, Abkhazia has more I would say has more tendencies towards independence uh, as the political elite in Abkhazia is more 
uh, inclined towards shifting uh, in, towards shifting to independence. Yet financially, Abkhazia, um, uh, about 50 to 60 percent of government budget in Abkhazia, as well as its tourist, tourism revenue, comes from Moscow. Uh, Russia has stationed its troops on the ground, uh, exercising control over the de facto uh, regime in Abkhazia. Um, Abkhazia is also known for, uh, for its de facto puppet regime, fully subordinated by Moscow, um, lacking any leverage really over, uh, over uh, even the so-called internal political decision making and the ability to exercise any effective control. Um, the occupation of uh, the Georgian territories remains Moscow's most effective in instrument as of today to exercise pressure against uh, Tbilisi, and the Kremlin continues to the process of growing militarization of the occupied territories on Georgian soil and ethnic discrimination of Georgian population. And we'll talk a bit about South Ossetia a little later. But what I want to understand right now is how are the governments functioning in these two autonomous republics? You know, are they very democratic? Are they very autocratic? What is the government system like in these two areas? So uh, both territories, South Ossetia, so-called South Ossetia and uh, Abkhazia, have de facto puppet regimes uh, that are fully subordinated by Moscow. And um, as of today, for example, the so-called South Ossetia has almost uh, uh, no value, I would say, for Russia, except for its use as a leverage against Tbilisi. Um, the, the, uh, from financial point of view, South Ossetia is um, almost fully, almost 100% dependent on Moscow. And um, these, uh, both of these regimes, um, the de facto regimes, are completely subordinated by Moscow, even though Moscow does not want to be perceived um, in this way. Uh, Moscow tries to be uh, tries to have a status of a mediator between the so-called two conflicting parties in the eyes of the international community, uh, which so far these efforts from Moscow have failed because uh, Currently, the Kremlin uh, exercises effective control, and this has been the case for years, and this has been uh, more evident uh, in the recent years, um, as, as, as we know, since the war of two, between Georgia and Russia in 2000, 2008. Russia has been uh, fully in charge of these regions and has been exercising control over the political, uh, the so-called internal political decision-making in these two territories. Do these two territories hold elections or is it decided by a committee? How is leadership decided in these two republics? Um, they do, but it is... Uh, I mean, it is uh, de facto elections, of course. When you look at the breakaway of the Moldovan Republic of Transnistria, they actually have their own passports. They're only recognized by Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and Russia, but they do have their own passports. Uh, for them to be able to travel internationally, the Russian government supplies Transnistrians with lots of Russian passports, making them Russian citizens by de facto. Does Russia extend this same offer to South Ossetia and Abkhazia, offering Russian citizenship to Abkhazian and South Ossetians. The passportization is a huge pro problem, um, even as of today, and uh, Russians have been using this as a, as a leverage um, over, the, over, over the population, and um, uh, they have been, Moscow-backed leaders in Abkhazia um, have been um, offering citizenship to, in ethnic Georgian uh, districts, uh, the so-called citizenship, and this is a kind of a way of uh, putting pressure and leverage and, uh, of course, illegal attempts of, uh, um, of exercising more control and of seizing the, uh, the uh, control over the territories which are internationally recognized um, uh, as territories of Georgia. Staying on the topic of borders, the border between South Ossetia and Georgia is not as concrete as most people would think. Yes, there's the usual roadblock and border post, on the roads in and out of between Georgia and South Ossetia, and yes, these are usually manned by Russian soldiers, but the rest of the border is just kind of barbed wires and chicken fencing. It really is the most basic way to show which side is which, really. But Moscow, being as cheeky as it is, has been using these frankly very poor borders to its own advantage. 
moving the border inch by inch further into Georgia most nights. Can you take us through what Russia is trying to achieve here by moving the border inch by inch further into Georgia? So borderization represents one of the key national security threats for Georgia uh, nowadays. Uh, Russia continues to violate Georgian sovereignty and territorial integrity with its strategy, uh, which involves the gradual annexation um, and further grabbing of Georgian territories through the expansion of its already illegal uh, occupation zones. Despite the enhanced partnership with NATO and strategic partnership with the US, Georgia faces the Russian aggression on a daily basis, and this kind of aggression, the borderization policy, affects um, citizens of Georgia on a daily basis. Um, Kremlin uh, also continues its growing militarization on Georgian soil, and is, its primary aim is to further grab the territories and uh, as demonstrated by its borderization policy. Despite the fact that since the August War of 2008, Russia has been identified and identified as part of as a party of the conflict, it still attempts to pretend otherwise by claiming that Russia's role in the conflict is a role of a peacekeeper. But in fact, the borderization policy proves otherwise. Uh, Kremlin wants to portray that there are two new independent states within the internationally recognized borders of Georgia, um, and uh, Russia is also violating the ceasefire agreement. Um, as of today, it does not allow international monitoring missions, such as the European Union monitoring mission, to enter the occupied regions of Georgia. And that's why um, this way uh, to proceed with the borderization policy, it is easier for Russia. Since the occupation of Abkhazia and Trinwali region and the recognition of their independence by Russia, the so-called administrative borderline has been separating the occupied territories from the rest of Georgia. And uh, this policy, the borderization policy, allows Russia to push the uh, administrative borderline further, expanding an occupation zone. Um, this policy, furthermore, takes advantage of Tbilisi's concern over the lasting loss of territory and tries to push the Georgian side into the uh, negotiation table with the Kremlin. Uh, for example, uh, the border markers were pushed to the village, village of Ditalubani in 2015, which included a 1,600-meter uh, 16, section of the 830-kilometer um, Bakusupsa oil pipeline that is operated by the British energy giant uh, BP. Um, and over the past uh, years, Russian-backed occupying forces detained hundreds of Georgians for illegally co crossing the so-called borderline, and our unlawful detentions have become very frequent um, in recently. The tension between these areas recently reached a new height, with Russia cancelling all direct flights between Russia and Georgia. Why would Russia be cancelling flights between these two nations? In 2019, uh, Georgians uh, protested the visit of a Russian parliamentary delegation at the Interparliamentary Assembly on Orthodoxy. Uh, this was held at the Georgian Parliament building, and the main reason for the protest was the presence of the Russian Communist MP, Sergei Gavrilov, who was uh, evic evicted from the country given the rising uh, tensions and given the protest that was expressed by um, ordinary Georgian citizens. Um, this was seen um, as a public humiliation for Putin's regime and uh, has also revealed uh, the failure of the Russia's of Russia's leverage over Georgia. The Kremlin denounced the events in Tbilisi and claimed that these events were the expression of, uh, quote, I'm quoting, Russophobic hysteria, claiming that radicals took over the parliament. In response to such political crisis, the Kremlin used its uh, usual Russophobia card to exert economic pressure on Georgia, justify a ban on flights, and call on Russian tourists to return home immediately. Um, Moscow has also furthermore hinted at the prospect of imposing embargo on Georgian wine purchases. This is also another economic leverage economic tool to put pressure on Tbilisi. This has been 
a tested mean of uh, pressure as Russia has previously banned the import of uh, Georgian wine between 2006 and uh, 2013. The decree on flight ban, which was issued in July 2019, also urged uh, Russian travel agencies to stop selling tours uh, to Georgia for as long as uh, the flight ban would remain in place. Uh, the Kremlin has described the ban as a temporary decision, but um, the decree did not give any specific end date to this ban. Um, this has targeted the tourism industry, um, and uh, it is a well-known weapon in the Kremlin's arsenal. Following the for example, following the downing of the Russian Su-24 in 2015, Moscow did a similar thing, banning all flights operating between Russia and Turkey. The travel ban hit the Turkish economy hard, and uh, this has led uh, to Turkey, uh, to Turkish president, uh, to um, uh, to an apology, um, and this uh, apology was followed by the restoration of bilateral ties and uh, lifting of sanctions. Uh, Kremlin may have expected the same uh, to happen in case of Georgia. On the surface, Abkhazia and South Ossetia appear to just be identical to the other Russian breakaway states like Transnistria or Donetsk. Being only recognized by their other breakaways, reliant on Moscow for most things, and preventing their mother country from being able to join NATO due to its no border disputes rule when joining. But these two breakaways, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, are really different. They're even different from each other, because it wouldn't be the Caucasus if it wasn't overly complicated. But to help us try and understand these two republics and what their future holds for them, we turn to our third guest. Part 3. The Middleman. I mean, the thing about Georgia is it's a place that, you know, is very unique, despite being at the crossroads of basically three big empires. Well, big empires for thousands of years, and then like Russia, Iran, and Turkey, especially. Georgia is a place that's, yeah, that, that, that has elements of a lot of it, elements of the Eastern Europe, of the Middle East, of, uh, of Turkey, of Iran, uh, but... It very much is its own place. Neil Hauer is a journalist and analyst usually based in Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia. His work primarily focuses on conflict and politics in the Caucasus region. Neil previously served as a senior intelligence analyst for the SecDev Group and has consulted for the EU and the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe on issues affecting the Caucasus region. And we're very happy to have him join us today. Well, before 2008, I mean, there was what? There was about one quarter, 20% of South Ossetia that was still, that had remained under Georgian government control following the war in the early 90s. And this was largely areas that had an ethnic Georgian population. And then as a result of the war in 2008, uh, the Georgian government lost control of these areas and they, they came under uh, South Ossetian and Russian control. And so there was another... I'm not sure, maybe 10,000 dis displaced people from those ethnic Georgians. There's still ethnic Georgians in those areas that live under South Ossetia's control. So when you look at the border between Transnistria and Moldova, people tend to cross that border all the time. It's not unusual for people from Transnistria to go into Kizhnev, the capital of Moldova, do their shopping, hang around for a bit, and then go back to live in Transnistria afterwards. It's not unusual for them to cross the border quite freely. Is that the same situation in somewhere like Georgia and South Ossetia, or is that line really harsh and people can't go from one to the other? Uh, no, it's much different. I mean, there there are some cases where South Ossetians can cross the line, where local civilians can cross into Georgian-held territory. And they, I mean, South Ossetians are, in, the Georgia considers them its own citizens, so they're entitled to free health care and, and et cetera in Georgia. And so this has been a thing in the past, but there's been a lot of closures of these points. And I think it was, I think for the better part of the last two years, uh, I'm, I'm not, not sure on this, but uh, those cro local crossing points have largely been closed. So South Ossetia is very isolated to much from Georgia to a much larger degree than Abkhazia is. One of the major assets South Ossetia has is the tunnel that connects one side of the Caucasus to the other. This tunnel once acted as the main highway between Russia and Georgia, but now because the South Ossetian borders are closed, the routes between Georgia and Russia are much more difficult. 
and much more easy to defend for Russia. Can you take us through this? I mean, the only real land route is through the the Georgia military highway to, um, to North Ossetia, that sort of the, this highway that goes north from Tbilisi, uh, skirts the eastern edge of South Ossetia, essentially, and then goes up through the Caucasus Mountains through the Daryal Pass, which is essentially the only um, natural opening in the Caucasus, the only natural pass through the Caucasus Mountains of any significance. Uh, and aside, uh, that, and that even that is something that often gets closed for several days at a time in the winter due to snowfalls, because you're going over, what if, I think the highest pass is 3,300 meters or something. And so it, it's, it, aside, and aside from that, the only other way through the Caucasus Mountains or, is you have to go around them. You either go around them at the eastern edge along the, uh, in Azerbaijan and in, in Russia along the Caspian Sea, or you go around them at the western edge along uh, Abkhazia and from Russia to Abkhazia to Georgia. But obviously that uh, that particular route uh, from Russia to Georgia has been blocked for the last 30 years. This gives Russia a pretty good defensive position in defending against a Georgian push, but not the best defensive position. So what I want to ask you is, why do you think the Russians didn't push fully in in 2008 and conquer all of Georgia and eliminate this problem from the start? I mean, they had already accomplished a lot of their goals. I mean, what, Russia, what is Russia going to gain from moving in and annexing effectively Georgia? It's just going to be a massive international issue for them. It's not going to give them anything, really. Um, they had already, you know, effectively in large part destroyed or routed the, the Georgian armed forces the, before that. And they had sent the very clear message to Georgia that NATO is not coming to save you, as uh, Saakashvili had thought would happen. Uh, NATO's not coming to save you. We can do this to you at any time if we so desire. And yeah, you better wise up in terms of uh, they, they, they sent the, the, the message to both Saakashvili and to the West that this is our backyard and uh, I'm, we are always going to be stronger here than you are. And they're, they're, yeah, so they, they accomplished their, their goals, essentially. And why did Saakashvili, who was president of Georgia at the time, think that NATO would come to the aid of Georgia in 2008? Because he misinterpreted some comments by the U.S. ambassador, by other people. Um, he had this idea in his head that it would be so, that he could, uh, that the Georgian armed forces could accomplish something like the, the Croats did in 1995 with Operation Storm, where NATO came in and helped them against the, the, the Serbs. Um, he, he essentially miscalculated very badly. And he also thought that, you know, for, Georgian troops will be able to get in there and they'll be able to capture and seal off the one tunnel that leads from South Ossetia into Georgia and stop reinforcements from coming in, which, as we know now, was a, a very bad miscalculation and it did not work like that at all. Right now, we've been talking about South Ossetia, which is a breakaway Republic of Georgia. But just over the border in Russia is the Republic of North Ossetia, which is a federal subject of the Russian Republic. How does the standard of living between these two republics compare? Are the citizens of North or South Ossetia better off? North Ossetia is, I mean, as all of the North Caucasus is, there are some of the poor regions, uh, some of the poorest regions of Russia, statistically. Uh, but having said that, I mean, you don't fit... Yeah, they don't feel as impoverished as some uh, ethnically Russian, really post-Soviet areas of Ru areas of Russia do. In that, you know, people are there's tight-knit communities and whatnot. Um, North Ossetia is uh, fairly nice. I mean, as far as that the local standards go, at least Vladikavkaz is quite a nice city. I mean, militarily, I understand why Russia holds on to South Ossetia as it keeps Georgia out of NATO. But why hold on to Abkhazia as well? What does Russia militarily gain from supporting both of these breakaway republics? I mean, Abkhazia is a place where it, it just sort of did, uh, fell out that way in the, the fallout from the collapse of the Soviet Union. And I mean, the, 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 the Russians ended up coming in and supporting the Abkhaz to break them off of Georgia and whatnot. Although, I mean, Russia's got a complicated relationship there too and that Russia and the CIS... Uh, imposed a, a full blockade on Abkhazia until 1999. So despite the fact that some elements of the Russian military supported the Abkhaz in the war, um, it was not a black and white thing. Um, but Abkhazia, I mean, it's another leverage point on Tbilisi. I mean, it was after 2008, the 2008 war, that Russia officially recognized Abkhazia and South Ossetia as independent. And so it's another point of leverage. Um, and Ab Abkhazia is a place that you know lies on a nice piece of real estate. It's a very popular uh, tourist destination for Russians, which I think is sort of its main 
uh, value economically or in that sort of sense to Russia. Um, yeah, militarily, you know, it's at a place where they it's, – it's just another chunk of the, the Black Sea in which they can operate. And how many operational troops does Russia keep inside Abkhazia? Yeah, I mean, what is, they have several thousand troops there. I don't think they, – they're always doing naval exercises there. I don't think they have any bases there. They have a big, in, big infantry land base near the, the town of Gudauta, but um, I don't believe they have uh, naval bases there. And what are the main differences between, let's say – an Abkhazian, a Georgian, and the South Ossetian? I mean, they're different in the sense that they have different languages. Um, I mean, all Caucasian peoples, all North Caucasian peoples, let's say. So uh, Georgia sort of fits into that. Uh, Georgia is being a South Caucasus country, but it sort of fits in as well. But Abkhaz, all the way across through, through the Ossetias, through to Dagestan, have, you know, similar cultural heritage and traditional music and clothing and um, cuisine and things like that. Um, the main difference between them politically is that uh, South Ossetia openly wants to be part of the Russian Federation. They want to have a referendum and join the Russian Federation, which Russia is not too keen on because it loses them a lot of leverage then. And Abkhazia wants to genuinely be an independent nation. If Abkhazia was to actually gain independence, do you think that would give them more autonomy and they'd be able to do more deals with other Black Sea countries like Romania and Ukraine, or would they still be completely beholden to Moscow? Well, it would certainly have more freedom in terms of it can't do anything right now that uh, for, for so many international organizations, um, they don't talk to or they can't talk to uh, Abkhazia unless Georgia gives them explicit permission to do it through them. So it prevents uh, so many international, so many diplomatic relations and so many international organizations from interacting with Abkhazia. And if, let's say, in some world, they're record or uh, um, which I think is extremely unlikely, but let's say that their independence is recognized by Georgia, uh, then, they, of course, they would be able to communicate freely with the, the, the outside world, and especially places like Turkey, you know, which is a, across the Black Sea, has a large Abkhaz diaspora, and, um, yeah, they would be able to actually interact with the outside world and not just be beholden to Russia. With the current state of affairs, how reliant is Abkhazia on other nations? For instance, with their power grid, are they mostly taking their power from the Georgian grids or are they taking most of their power from Russian grids across the Caucasus? Abkhazia uh, famously uses, uh, what is it, 40% of the power from the Inguri Dam, which is a major hydroelectric dam in Georgia near the boundary, and they operate it jointly. And Abkhazia uses the power from that, but uh, it's, it's, not, it's already not enough for their needs, and lately... In the last year or two, they've had a lot of problems with illegal cryptocurrency mining, Bitcoin mining, and people drawing off the grid there. And so there's been, for the last few months now in Abkhazia, there's been rolling blackouts as a, as a result of that. And Russia supplies them a bit of power, but not much, and doesn't want to supply more. And so uh, Abkhazia, the, the power, the electricity situation is a difficult one for them. But surely if Russia is intending to be in Abkhazia for a very long time, in this de facto state of affairs, they would look at investing in the power grid and making sure that the people there are happy with Russia's occupation there. So why then are we in this situation where Abkhazia's power grid is so shoddy? I mean, the Russians have gone through phases of giving more subsidies and less subsidies to Abkhazia. And, you know, essentially the peak of it was around like 2010 to 2013 in the, the, the wake of the, them recognizing their independence and the wake of the war. And they were giving, what is it, over $100 million a year in subsidies. And then uh, they, these subsidies largely amounted to nothing because the local political administration there is so corrupt that they were just siphoned off and not much happened. And so Russia, in a lot of ways, lost patience with this and just downgraded the subsidies. And now they're at, I forget the exact level, but they're much lower. They're like something like 40% of what they were at the peak, 30 or 40%. And um, I mean, it doesn't help Russia. There's doesn't particularly help Russia if Abkhazia is more developed or not. I mean, Russia doesn't need Abkhazia to be developed. It just needs it to exist. Russia is, is a country that is um, in that their own development plans intentionally neglect parts of the parts of Russia uh, because they don't have the money to go around uh, to, to upgrade them. So there's plenty of places in Russia that are as bad off as Abkhazia. So they can hardly afford to develop their own infrastructure, let alone uh, some other little uh, vassal statelet where they don't need it. The current set of circumstances obviously prevents Georgia from entering NATO and puts a war right on Georgia's doorstep. Do you think Georgia would ever recognize Abkhazia and South Ossetia in exchange for solidifying borders and 
possible NATO membership as well. Would Tbilisi ever be happy with that situation? I mean, Georgia would never. It's all. It's very, very difficult to see a scenario in which Georgia would um, accept these states being broken away. I think, especially South Ossetia. South Ossetia is right in the middle of the country, and uh, it's you know, it's a Georgia. Georgia at least recognizes Abkhazia as an autonomous province with its current boundaries. So Georgia actually has the the government in exile of the autonomous Republic of Abkhazia, which is a Georgian government approved cabinet, which sits in Tbilisi. Um, but they don't even recognize South Ossetia as a separate territorial unit. Um, so I don't think, and I, and I just in general, I think that there's such a low chance that Georgia would ever recognize these states as truly independent, um, even if it is like very hard to see them being reintegrated into Georgia. Uh, I very much have a hard time seeing that they would uh, accept them, as, especially because if, so without South Ossetia is a geographic location, then with Abkhazia. It's a lot more the sentimental ties in terms of there was 250,000 ethnic Georgians that were were expelled from Abkhazia during the war, which is about like eight, nine percent of the population of Georgia today, which is a, such a huge amount. And there so there's so many people with memories of Abkhazia who grew up there. Um, and this has become romanticized over time, too. And people remember it as the the Soviet Riviera, you know, the Pearl of the the, the Black Sea Riviera. And so it really holds this very important sentimental place for Georgians as well. So, I mean, that doesn't, it's, it's hardly even about the realities of whether or not they ever will become reintegrated with Georgia. I don't, I have a hard time seeing any scenario where Georgia uh, recognizes or accepts their independence. When you look at nations around the world, the countries that most often get invaded. They're mostly crossroad areas. The country's major powers have to stomp through to invade another great power. Think Poland, Iraq, or Korea. And Georgia would probably sit in that category too, being surrounded by Russia, Iran, and Turkey. But they've held on to themselves better than most in this region, and they've done this by acting as a middleman for the rest of the countries. The one you can trust with your pipelines, your transit routes, and even large Chinese investments. But how they managed to pull this off? How is George the middleman, the bartender of the rowdy bar? But to talk more about that, we turn to our fourth guest. Part four. There's a bear in the woods. Well, we have a protracted uh, political crisis in Georgia. It's been going on for a few weeks, but it, it um, since the arrest of a leading opposition figure, but it dates back to last October uh, when there was a crucial parliamentary election, and, and it goes back even further than that. The, what's basically at issue is that there are two big parties in Georgia, the current ruling party, Georgian Dream, and the former ruling party uh, linked to former president Saakashvili, United National Movement. And those ruling parties, you know, to, not to put too fine a point on it, really want to destroy one another. They're, they're not in it for compromise uh, and, and sharing power. So when Georgian Dream was declared the winner in the uh, elections last October, uh, the United National Movement cried foul. They said there'd been irregularities in the poll. There had been some, but I don't think enough to invalidate the election. Um, but they came in a fairly distant second place, and they, they, along with the rest of the opposition, then boycotted the new parliament. So there's only been one party actually sitting in the parliament since then. And then the um, Georgian dream, rather than kind of de-escalate, um, has been going for the jugular, and they had the leader of the UNM, uh, the international the Opposition United National Movement arrested um, a few weeks ago, which obviously sparked uh, a new round of crisis. And indeed, the, the, the man who was prime minister actually resigned, um, saying that he wasn't happy with this um, decision to to arrest the, you know, who's the man who's the former leader of the opposition, Nico Melia. Now you have the European Union mediating, but... Um, Unfortunately, not much sign of a, of a breakthrough, so a kind of protracted political standoff there. 
Thomas Tavall is a senior fellow for Carnegie Europe, specializing in the Caucasus region. Tom has written a number of major books on this region and is widely regarded as one of the best authorities when it comes to the Caucasus. It's also Tom's second appearance here in the Red Line, and we're very excited to have him back. He joins us today. Russia, for most Georgians, is a kind of looming threat back to the 1990s when Russia helped the Abkhaz and the South Ossetians fight the Georgians um, in those conflicts in the early 1990s. Those were basically late, um, started as local conflicts, but Russia did get, did, did get involved. Again, in 2008, um, Russia, after the, um, the five-day war between Russia and Georgia, Russia then recognized Abkhazia and South Ossetia as, as independent. And, you know, the two countries have had no diplomatic relations since then. So Russia obviously bears um, Georgia no uh, goodwill. There's still masses of problems there. Having said all that, um, I don't think we should frame the current crisis in Georgia as a kind of pro-Russia, pro-West um, uh, uh, crisis. Um, the, the, the two parties there, one of them is definitely uh, more anti-Russian than the other, but neither of them are particularly pro-Russian. Um, and it's basically about domestic politics. Um, it's about power. It's about who controls the economy. It's about grudges and revenge more than it is about more than it is about russia when you visit georgia it feels like a european country and doing more and more work to closely connect with their partners in the eu but it's not until you look closely at the stats that you find a different story as much as the eu is a major partner in terms of trade the csis russia's version of nato is a far bigger trading partner for georgia but do you see that changing anytime soon the, the, the picture is actually a bit more mixed than that. A lot of trade goes to Russia, particularly um, agricultural products. Um, about three quarters of Russian, uh, Georgia's wine, which is obviously a very important export in Georgia, goes to Russia, which is traditionally Russian, Russian, particularly Russian women, funnily enough, have always traditionally drank uh, Georgian wine. But um, there, there's... China is now, I think, number three in Georgia's exports. Um, Turkey is up there, and and uh, and European countries as well. Uh, very little goes to America, so it's, it's actually quite a mixed uh, trading picture, which I think kind of reflects Georgia's location. You know, in the middle um, country, in the middle, caught between kind of Russia to the north, uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Iran to the south, to the west, you've got the Black Sea and Europe. Um, and Turkey, and to the east, you've got the Caspian Sea uh, and Asia. So it's it's you know that the the trading picture basically uh, reflects that. I guess I guess the issue going forward is is to what extent Georgia can actually produce higher quality products and not just be um, you know basically uh, a a country that has a bit of mining and, and a lot of agriculture and and produce something that. That people want to buy apart from their wine which is obviously a bit of a, a niche market one of georgia's major money makers is its role as a transit country for both gas and oil azerbaijan and the caspian sea nations put their pipelines through georgia which then travel on to turkey in the european market they do this because in this region of the world georgia is probably the most politically stable to put the pipe through People tend to know that they can invest in Georgia and in 40 years their pipeline will probably still be safe. But it also requires paying Georgia a large royalty fee for the transit, which is a big expense on the mining companies. What has changed though in this region is the situation in Nagorno-Karabakh. With the Azeri victory in the field, it's looking like Azerbaijan will have a direct corridor through to Turkey through Nachivan. And technically what that means is Azerbaijan could build a pipeline that connects their Caspian gas fields all the way to Turkey without going through Georgia. With the situation changing in Nagorno-Karabakh, is Georgia at risk of losing the golden goose that is transit royalties? Yeah, this is obviously a big question. Um, the, the, the war in Karabakh um, last year obviously changed the map and suddenly Azerbaijan and Turkey and Russia also have this prospect of a new kind of transit route which doesn't go over the mountains of the Caucasus which are closed um, by snow for several months of the year. It doesn't go through Georgia which is obviously um, not, not the chosen path of, of the Russians and goes um, 
So a, a transit route that goes um, from Russia down the, the, the coast of the Caspian Sea through Azerbaijan across the newly um, cap recaptured territories of Azerbaijan from Armenia across a tiny bit of Armenia. That's the kind of controversial bit, but that's in, in the ceasefire plan um, that ended the war um, into Nahichevan, the exclave of Azerbaijan, um, and into Turkey. So obviously this is, um, it would be easier to have a map. Um, I don't know if anyone's got one in front of them, but that, that is a route which bypasses Georgia. And that means that Georgia could theoretically in a few years, if, if this all gets rebuilt, which is quite a big ask because everything's been completely destroyed over the last 30 years, could Georgia could lose its status as the big transit hub. So I think this is a wake up call to Georgia. It's not going to happen tomorrow. The infrastructure is already there. These oil and gas pipelines that go from Azerbaijan through Georgia uh, into Turkey. Um, but certainly Georgia can no longer take that for granted. And I think it's a wake up call. And in particular, it's a wake up call for this big project, which is now being put on hold to have a deep sea port um, um, on Georgia's Black Sea coast in a place called Anaklia, which would be um, Georgia's um, kind of serious port, which has never had to have um, container ships. Um, that project's been put on hold for a variety of reasons. I think, you know, it's time um, for Georgia and for uh, the Europeans actually to, to take a second look at that. And who are the major investors on that project? Who's putting the money up for Anaclia? Well, that's always been the issue. It, it, the Anaclia Corporation at the current currently um, mostly has um, uh, American money in there. Seattle port is in there. The Chinese were interested at one point. But I think um, the issue, I think, which that project keeps on coming up against is that it's, it's a political risk to put a... a a port there it's right next to abkhazia it's you know within shooting distance of the russians if, it, if there should ever be another shooting war um and um so for, as a commercial venture i guess you know it, it can make sense but but only if there's a certain political risk um and insurance element factored in there and the international ifis the europe the big governments have never really put up the money. I think the European Union is, is now offering to put up 50 to 75 million euros behind it, which would actually be, be quite a lot. So it's a, it's a question of whether others can put up some money to actually, um, you know, back the political risk then. And what would the European Union hope to gain out of a port like this? Well, I think it's this port is seen as... Um, good for the Georgian economy, good for a kind of east-west transit route, which does not go through Russia, um, that it's a kind of missing piece in this uh, east-west corridor, which is um, from either through um, from Turkey through the Bosphorus or from Romania across the Black Sea into Georgia through Azerbaijan and then into Central Asia. It's, it's you know, it's it's a less easy route logistically than going um, across Russia, but um, those countries I think are deemed to be uh, more friendly, um, and so it's a kind of middle route between um, Europe and Asia, that over overland route that doesn't go either through Russia or via Iran. I think that's that seemed to be the attraction here. Armenia has a very complicated relationship with Tbilisi. Militarily, Yerevan is very close with Russia housing a number of Russian military bases and airfields, but they also have a large Armenian diaspora inside of Georgia and heavily rely on Georgia as a transit route for goods and services. Can you try and explain the complicated relationship between Armenia and Georgia? How far back do you want to go, really, with the Armenians and the Georgians? They're the two big Christian nations of this region. Uh, they're very, each of them quite proud, going all the way back to kind of 301, AD in the Armenian case and, and maybe just a decade after in the Georgian case of being the first two nations really to adopt Christianity. Um, but funnily enough, they've never, it's always been a slightly uneasy relationship, a slightly kind of jealous relationship between the, between the two of them. Um, they've always um, been focused on, on different things. I guess Georgia is luckier geographically. Um, um, you know, has the Black Sea and, and the mountains protecting it to the north, uh, at least until the Russians 
came in in the 19th century, Armenians have always been much more exposed. They never had statehood in the same way. Um, and so there's, they, they've, they've kind of had friendly rivalry or, or tensions all the way through. Um, and then a lot of, as, as, you've, as you've mentioned, a lot of Armenians in Georgia, actually the Georgian capital city, Tbilisi, used to be a, a big Armenian city, actually, if you hear, read 19th century travelers' accounts. You know, the, 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 the kind of bourgeois of, of Tbilisi back in the 19th century were mostly Armenians. The mayor used to be traditionally an Armenian there. Um, they left, most of them left in, in the 20th century. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think that the two countries have ever been interested in fighting a war. There's never been the kind of existential threat that Armenians have felt towards Turks or Azerbaijanis, which is part of the driving, one of the driving factors of the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict. The Armenians and Georgians kind of know that they need, need each other. Maybe the Armenians need the Georgians a bit more because they need the access um, to the Black Sea, uh, which the Georgians can provide. So that they sort of do get along, um, but they've obviously looked geopolitically in quite different directions. Armenia traditionally seeing Russia as its kind of big protector to the north uh, against the Turks, and, and the Georgians always not looking so much towards their neighbours in the Caucasus, but always having these kind of European ambitions looking across, across the Black Sea uh, towards Europe. The even more complicated relationship with this one is the one that Georgia has with Ankara and Moscow. Obviously, being the middleman between these two, Georgia has to tread a very fine line. But where do you think that relationship is going? Do you think Georgia is heading further towards Ankara or further towards Moscow? Well, certainly not with Moscow. I mean, um, no prospect of a thaw there uh, ever since, you know, well, certainly since uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union, there's been very difficult relations and then even more so since 2008 after Russia after that war and Russia recognized Abkhazia and South Ossetia which the, the Georgians basically say is occupation of their territory so no no prospect uh, of a thaw there at least I think as long as Vladimir Putin is in office which could be quite a long time um relationship with Turkey is is better but again has its problems it's a very big trading relationship um, with Turkey, you see um, when you go to Georgia, it's full of Turkish uh, trucks, Turkish businesses, Turkish cafes. Politically, I guess they're not quite so close, um, uh, particularly in this kind of era of, of President Erdogan, who is who is not, not so friendly with the with the West as as, as the Georgians are. But the, but they you know they they do they do get along. I get I guess apart from. Russia, the Georgians try and have a bit of a balancing foreign policy that they try and, you know, keep on uh, as good terms as with um, with everyone they can, whether it be Armenia and Azerbaijan or Turkey and Iran or China, um, but obviously reserving what they think is the best relationship with the Europeans and with the United States. What do you think the future holds for the breakaway republics of Abkhazia and South Ossetia? Do you think we'll see something more akin to Transnistria, where the borders are fairly solid and there's no shooting these days? Or do you think it would be closer to something like Donetsk that flares up from time to time and there's still artillery and shooting across the borders? Well, I don't think either of those comparisons uh, work, actually, for Abkhazia and South Ossetia. And I guess the first thing to say is that they're quite different from each other. Obviously, they were recognized by Russia uh, on the same day in 2008, obviously, they both had conflicts with Georgia in the early 1990s, but they're different kinds of places. Um, South Ossetia is actually really, really tiny. The, the, the population of Ossetians there is probably less than 40,000 now. It used to have more than 100,000 back in, in the Soviet, Soviet era. Um, but obviously, most, almost all the Georgians have left. A lot of the Ossetians have left too. Um, there's nothing much there apart from a few pretty mountains um and basically um the south settings if they could join russia tomorrow they would do so um at the blink of an eye um they there's north ossetia on the other side of the mountains which is um a much bigger ossetian region where which is basically the kind of big capital for them 
and they would basically very happily join um, North Ossetia. No one really believes in this idea of, of South Ossetia as, as an independent state. No one really believes in Abkhazia either as an independent state, but they believe in it a bit more seriously. They, they, they've um, are still hostile to the Georgians um, because of the war in the 90s and, and what they say the Georgians did to them in the 20th century, particularly in the Stalin era. Um, and they rely on Russia. Russia is, you know, increasingly runs the place. Um, Russia obviously provides all their border guards and a lot of the economy. Uh, but it's, it's not a, it's a kind of more of a transactional relationship than they, they also um, have their problems with Russia uh, uh, as well. So when you talk to the Abkhaz, who are, who are kind of a small and proud people, that they insist that what they want is independence um, from both Georgia and from Russia. That's pretty unrealistic, but it's, say, it's what they, they say they want. And practically speaking, I, I mean, I don't think they're going to get independence, but practically speaking, that means that they want to keep contacts open a bit with Georgia to kind of not have all their eggs in the Russian basket. So if Georgia can't solve this problem diplomatically, does it have a military option on the table? Does Georgia have the capability of retaking either of these two breakaway republics? I guess there's a more um, hard-headed real politic reason, which is that Georgia tried that in South Ossetia in, in 2008. Um, former President Sarkis really tried to retake South Ossetia um, and for 24 hours, he was doing pretty well. Um, he, he took the, the main city, Tsin Valley, and then the Russians came in and hammered his troops, uh, the Georgian troops. They threw them out of South Ossetia. Uh, they went into Georgia for a while as well uh, and humiliated the Georgians and then recognized Abkhaz in South Ossetia, um, thereby making things much worse. And, you know, um, the Georgians have rebuilt their military to a certain extent, but there's certainly no match for the Russians, and they were, I think if they were to try that, there would be a, a repeat uh, scenario, and and the Georgians' prospects of getting th anything done, and, you know, any all the kind of small bits of agreement they have with uh, Abkhazia in particular over things like you know healthcare, electricity, some access for some people, all those, all that would be shut down uh, immediately. More people would die, more bitterness. Um, it, it, it's really not a solution. Russia's invested a lot of money into Grozny and some of the southern Caucasus areas. They're even moving the main Russian naval base on the Caspian from Astrakhan to Kaspis to be closer to the Caucasus region. Do you think that's a signal that the Russians are looking to get more involved in the Caucasus over the next few years? I think, you know, the Caucasus is obviously an area that Russia traditionally cares about. Um, you know, I don't think Russia builds its whole foreign policy around it. It's not you know, I think they see they, the Russians in their mindset saw the prospect of Ukraine going west as a big threat to them, um, even if that maybe wasn't wasn't the case. But, but they, they constructed it as a threat. Um, so Ukraine and Belarus, I think, are, are more important for them than the Caucasus. Um, you know, there, there are not so many ethnic Russians, for example, in the Caucasus, in the South Caucasus, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan. Um, I think they accept that these countries are are independent. There's obviously a bit of a caveat over um, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, but broadly, you know, they accept that these countries are independent. They're not going to reconquer them. Um, so I, I, th I think, um, you know, Russia has its certain interests in the Caucasus. It wants open communication routes. It wants it doesn't want these countries uh, to join NATO. It, it would like to see, you know, the Russian language preserved there, but they're not going to die in, in a ditch over that. They're, they're, they're going to, you know, use what they're going to throw their weight around to a certain extent, but they're not going to base their whole foreign policy over it. And my last question for you is a fairly big one. Will Georgia ever get NATO membership? They've been trying for a long time and it would secure their borders, but is it actually an attainable goal for Tbilisi? This is a very tricky one, and I make myself my unself make make myself unpopular in Georgia by saying this. I don't think Georgia is going to join NATO for a variety of reasons. You know, the state of its democracy might be one at the moment, um, um, but I think you know there are deeper reasons, which is that a lot of NATO members 
um, probably France, Germany, Italy among them, don't want to see a country join NATO with these unresolved uh, territorial conflicts. Um, they just see that as, as, as getting a kind of direct confrontation between NATO and Russia that they'd rather avoid. And I, th I think I would, I would add to that that I think, um, you know, Georgia has a security problem with Russia that it can solve um, maybe in, in a different way by, by it has a strong security relationship now with the United States. The United States trains its troops, they sell weapons. And that actually is, is, is kind of guaranteeing the security of Georgia, I think, better than um, trying to join NATO, antagonizing Russia, and possibly, um, you know, drawing deeper di dividing lines between um, the Georgians and the Abkhaz and the South Ossetians. I, I, I think, you know, if they were suddenly to join um, NATO tomorrow, then, you know, they'd basically be, be losing Abkhazia. I don't, see, I don't, I think that border in Western Georgia with Abkhazia would, would, you know, become a much more militarized border by the Russians and a lot of people, including a lot of Georgians um, on, on the other side of the border would, would lose out. So, so, you know, personally, um, I understand the Georgians' you know, security issues with Russia, but I think, I think NATO, the ambition to join NATO just doesn't look viable at the moment, and they should be exploring uh, other options to to guarantee their security. And I think the United States is providing those at the moment. He who controls the crossroads controls the flow of traffic. The Georgians are pivotal to each of these regional players' expansion plans. So the EU wants to use Georgia to bypass its ever-worsening relationships with its neighbours in Turkey and Russia, hoping to build a large naval port on the Black Sea, so it can launch goods from Romania, across the Black Sea to Georgia, then onto Azerbaijan and the rest of Asia. A sort of backup plan if things continue to sour between Ankara, Moscow and Brussels. The trouble is with this plan though, that Russia will always be against this, as it reduces their leverage, and Turkey is against it for the same reason. Another major problem with this is that the deep sea port they want to build is within range of the Russian guns at Abkhazia. So whether it be the Chinese investors hoping for this route as well, the hesitancy to invest will always be there, knowing that any hostilities flaring up could quite easily lead to shelling of their port. Turkey loves having Georgia where it is, a buffer between Russia and their most troublesome regions in the northeast of Turkey, with Georgia acting as a safe passage for Turkish pipelines and trade routes between Ankara and their cousins in Azerbaijan. But now that there might be a direct corridor between Azerbaijan and Turkey through the newly conquered areas around Nachivan, will Ankara be as reliant on Georgia? Whilst things are still tense in Nagorno-Karabakh, I would say yes, but it's only a matter of time until the situation begins to solidify, and it may not re-solidify in Tbilisi's favour. Russia already has so many problems to contend with in the North Caucasus, with Muslim separatist groups in Chechnya and Dagestan. To have an antagonistic Georgia as well would be far too much for Moscow to ever be happy with, so instead Russia puts pressure on Georgia making sure Tbilisi is always off balance. And whilst Abkhazia is also a breakaway state, it's South Ossetia that really puts the stress on Tbilisi, with the border being only 100 kilometers up the road from the capital. And the biggest natural obstacle Tbilisi relied on to keep them safe, the Caucasus Mountains, is no longer a factor. The Russians having troops already positioned on the Tbilisi side of the Great Dividing Mountain Range, with nothing else standing in the way between Skinvali and Tbilisi. Georgia sees itself as European, as closer to its brothers in Greece, Romania or Bulgaria, just over the Black Sea. But things are unlikely to change on the ground for Georgia, and they will likely remain right where they are, as the crossroads for the Caucasus. Thank you so much for everybody who tuned into this episode. This should be the week we hit the 1.5 million streams mark across all of our platforms, and I cannot thank everyone enough who's listened to the program, shared it, or mentioned us to their friends. This was only possible because of all of your support. And we're already starting to plan what we do to celebrate the 2 millionth stream, and I cannot wait to celebrate that with you. 
If you want to stay up to date with everything we're doing here at the show, please feel free to follow us on social media. You can find us on the handle at the Red Line Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Reddit, Discord, Swell, and YouTube. Or you can follow me on Twitter on the handle at Mike Elliott Oz. Oz is in Australia. There is no way we could have gotten to 1.5 million streams without the amazing support of our dedicated Patreons. They donate a few dollars a month to help us keep this show running and paying for the costs such as hosting, website fees, lawyers, staff, and programs to be able to make this show possible. If you're a Patreon already, you should have had an email in your inbox last week with all the details for our next Q&A session, as well as our private GeoGuessr and Beers session coming up as well. If you aren't a Patreon yet, sign up before this weekend and you'll be invited to these as well. I really enjoy these catch-ups because they're always a lot of fun with a great bunch of people and I get the chance to thank personally each and every one of you for your support of the program. I look forward to seeing you next week for it. A huge thanks to all of our guests this week. Gerard Toll is absolutely amazing when it comes to the history of this region. His book, Near Abroad, is one I haven't been able to put down over the last few days. It was amazing to be able to get him to come and take us through the complexity that is the Caucasus. And if you want to learn more about the Caucasus, you can find Gerard on Twitter on the handle toll underscore crit geo. Nadia Siskordia has been a guest I have wanted to get on the program for ages now, and she's one of the most driven and informed people analyzing this region. She always has her finger right on the pulse for what is coming up for these countries. And it's pretty easy to see why so many of the world's leading think tanks are competing to work with her. It was a pleasure having her on the program and we look forward to having her back really soon. You can find Natia on Twitter on the handle nsiskudia. Neil Hauer has been an amazing conflict journalist for a long time now, reporting everywhere from the slums of Grozny to the trenches in Nagorno-Karabakh. So if you ever wanted up-to-the-minute info, Neil's Twitter is always a great place to go for it. If you want to find Neil's Twitter, you can reach him on the handle at Neil P. Hauer. Thomas Duval is a pinnacle of Caucasus analysis and is a good friend of the show. When you watch almost any panel on the region, Thomas is usually at the center of that panel, and it's fairly easy to see why. There is few people better to speak and listen to if you want an in-depth look at this tumultuous region. And I highly recommend you follow Thomas Twitter for great analysis pieces. You can find Tom on Twitter with the handle at Tom underscore Duval. As has become a standard segment here on the show, here are the three books I recommend you check out if you want to do a deeper dive into this topic further. The first book would be The Caucasus by Thomas Duval. This book is one of the definitive guides for understanding the Caucasus and is one of the main reasons Tom is so highly regarded in this field. It's definitely worth the read. The second book is Near Abroad by Gerard Toll. The Caucasus and its resources have been the crown jewel of Russia for a very long time now, and it's easy to see why everyone from the Ottomans to the Germans to the Mongols to the Russians fought hard to try and capture it. Duran's book takes a fascinating look at the history of this storied region. And my third recommended book is All the Kremlin's Men by Mikhail Zeiger, a fantastic Russian journalist. This book focuses on the oligarchs that surround Vladimir Putin, and how Putin has shaped and moulded Russia over the last few decades. So it's not really fully focused on Georgia, but it does have an amazing perspective though on the Russo-Georgian War of 2008, talking through Putin's personal thinking and giving first-hand accounts of Putin's decision-making processes from the oligarchs and generals who were there with him at the time. It is an amazing book to read not only for just this, but also the other insights into the inner workings of the Kremlin, and how the Russian state functions under Vladimir Putin. Highly recommend it. As usual, I want to thank my amazing team for all of their work on this episode. Mark Spencer has been doing a lot of voiceover work for us for quite a while now, and he's just moved to New Zealand, and we wish him really well. He'll still be part of the show. Mark is currently putting together a petition to get Apple Podcasts to add a climate category to the podcast section so people can more easily find information on how climate change is affecting the world and what we can do to help. It's a great initiative, and if you want to go check it out and find out how you can support him, you can find Mark on the Twitter handle at Climactic Show. Owen Swift's role here at the show has been getting bigger and bigger, 
acting as a producer, a writer, and a researcher, and helping to redesign the website. The show is making huge leaps at the moment, and a lot of that is thanks to Owen. The more involved he gets in the program, the better and better it becomes. And we're very, very happy to have him on board. If you want to find Owen on Twitter and pick his brain, you can find him on the handle Owen A. Swift. Marissa Rafter has just joined our team as an animator, turning these episodes into short videos of about five minutes, making it much easier to share with friends and family who may not be ready for a full hour and a half piece on a subject. She just released her second video about Guyana's defensive strategy and it was absolutely phenomenal. She brought a complicated topic to life and made it incredibly encapsulating. And we are so proud to have her on board here at the show. If you want to check out that video, it's available on our YouTube channel. Joe Hawthorne is the main reason this show sounds as good as it does, and that's thanks to his great audio cleaning skills. There are so many podcasts out there with fantastic guests, but terrible audio, and Joe is what stops this show from becoming one of those. He's a fantastic guy and an even better audio engineer. And if you want to find him on Twitter, you can visit him on the handle at JoeHawthorne77. The last thanks goes out to you for tuning into the show. Watching this show hit 1.5 million has been nothing but amazing. There is no way I ever thought this show would get anywhere near that. But what's made it all worthwhile has been the amazing people and friends I've made whilst doing this show. So many of you have reached out to me and had geopolitical questions or chats or even just compared our notes on subjects. And I honestly really enjoy that. Interactions like that are the reason I still enjoy doing this show. And it's the reason I will still keep doing the show. And I look forward to meeting even more of you as we approach the 2 million mark. The Red Line will be back in another fortnight with another international episode. But until then, thank you and good night. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of Michael, our guests, and the Red Line podcast. They do not represent any government or organization and are solely our own. For more information, please visit theredlinepodcast.com.